Hello everybody, this is the lecture for Section 4, Economics 170 at John Jay. Section 4 here is on discrimination within the field of economics. And as much as, generally speaking, the rest of this course from this point forward focuses on issues of crime and as they relate to social problems, uh, this is more of a topic that's a social problem such as can be the topic we discussed earlier in the course which is economic class issues the issue of discrimination within society certainly would be considered a social problem heading in the direction of crime versus a crime that causes social problems now anytime we're trying to measure direct causality like this uh, we really uh, you know there's we're not exactly uh, ever able to do so. The world is a complexly determined thing in which things are shaped all over the place. Directions of causality are always problematic. However, to say that the arrow points more generally or more frequently from issues of discrimination towards issues of crime, well, even that can become problematic in that discrimination often pervades both within and outside of our criminal justice system and even around what things are considered crimes and how those crimes are punished discrimination can be a major issue uh, a good example of that and I'm not sure if this law has these laws have been changed certainly if you look throughout the 1990s at the federal penalties around powdered cocaine versus crack cocaine uh, the penalties were much much different for crack cocaine to the point that a drug that's more often used by poor members of society and also by non-caucasian non-white members of society generally speaking has a much much different penalty than a chemically very similar drug in fact one synthesized from the other of powdered cocaine uh, where the penalties are far more lenient for possession for distribution for basically all along the spectrum than that of crack so broadly speaking with that example moving forward discrimination pervades every aspect of the society in which it's found Certainly it's found above all in attitudes around race, but also around social relations, you know, things around marriages, that sort of things, residential locations. Frequently there's discrimination in legal barriers in society as well. This lecture on discrimination will cover basically all of the readings, chapter 14 and 15 of Understanding Capitalism, which I have assigned are essentially about, uh, chapter 14 is about kind of the broad sweeping economic inequality in society and some of the discriminatory causes behind that. In chapter 15, I just want you to look at quickly really, um, certainly it's not a bad thing if you read it in more details around global development and issues of do we need some parts of the world to be rich or some people to be rich, or sorry, do we need some people to be poor in order for others to be rich? And I'll mention, I'll talk about all of those as well as the other reading that I've assigned as well. But when discrimination does exist and does prevail every aspect of society, it's not just in attitudes around race and social relations and marriage and residential location and legal barriers. All of these things do exist. But it can also often be found in levels of economic accomplishment. There's often discrimination around income, wages, the, even the price is paid. Even the price paid in our so-called free market society um, can be discriminatory. And certainly a huge, huge issue there's around in terms of levels of economic accomplishment, there's often discrimination around the extension of credit. The economic dimension of discrimination hardly appears in general treatments of economics. In most economics literature, in most of the literature of my profession, in most journal articles and professional writings and conferences and these sorts of things, uh, discrimination is not really 
often viewed or often seen. Uh, nevertheless, I think it's really important as a standard of this profession that we do discuss these things and that economists do take time to work through how issues of discrimination impact our society. I mean, it's important in and of itself for many reasons, and I don't need to explain or go through all of those reasons to any of you. That's just would be silly. You all know kind of the harm on a very basic social level that can come from discrimination. But I also think it's an important test of the standard of my profession as well, the profession of economists, that we do give at least attempt to give fair treatment to these ideas. So, from a kind of very basic scientific standpoint, discrimination is really considered um, something that deviating from the average, or something deviating from what's considered to be even, to be fair, to be the proper treatment of a society. For instance, if I was to say that the unemployment rate is about 8% or 8.5% nationwide right now. If I then took a certain group and said, okay, the unemployment rate is 8% right now nationwide, but it is 13% for African Americans and 22% for African American males under the age of 30. These numbers are not exact, but the pattern is a consistent one through history and through time in the United States. This could be evidence of discrimination. It's not always evidence of discrimination, but it could be. There's certainly little kind of wiggle room with the facts. The facts are that if you take the national unemployment rate of whatever it is, 8.5%, certain groups deviate from this. Generally speaking, younger people have higher unemployment rates. African-American and Latino populations have higher unemployment rates than the national average. These differences do not necessarily mean that discrimination exists. In this case, in this example, I think they probably do have a lot to do with discrimination exists. But let's take an example. Let's say that wages are higher for whites. White people make more money on average. This is, again, this is something that's a measurable fact over the history of the country ever since these numbers have been kept. Is there discrimination in the labor market then becomes the question. Is the labor market itself, supply and demand, these sorts of things for wage, for wage labor, is there discrimination in that market? And that's not necessarily the case. These differences in wages, the fact that whites make more money than other ethnicities within the country, they can come from other aspects. They can come from differences in location throughout the country. They could come from differences of education. I mean, does discrimination exist? Yeah, of course it exists. But to say that it's discrimination in the labor market, to say that people look at their employees and say, this guy's white and this guy's black, I'm going to pay the white guy a higher wage because I like white people more or whatever silly, that's a great sound bite. Um, I should be careful what I say in this lecture in terms of people being able to clip these things and put them on YouTube. Nah, I know none of you, that's just a silly comment, but I'm trying to make light because this is a very serious topic. It's, um, but for, you know, that discrimination in the labor market for people to say that discrimination exists at the point of education or at the point of payment for a job done. It's not always the case. Discrimination of course, ex course exists, but it could be discrimination at other points of society through other times. It could be around the education received, the opportunities for higher education, all these sorts of things. For our purposes for this class, um, discrimination is treating someone differently because of that person's membership in a certain class. Now that class can be race, it can be rich, it can be poor, whatever. Um, not whatever in the sense of whatever, it doesn't matter, whatever in the sense of if somebody is treated differently because of their membership of a certain group, effectively discrimination is taking place. That's how we're going to define it for this course. Now, the traditional 
kind of thought through neo neoclassical kind of modern mainstream economic analysis is that free markets will eliminate discrimination. And basically the idea around this is that if I'm choosing to discriminate, then I will be outcompeted. If I'm choosing to only hire white workers and pay them $10,000 a year, hmm, excuse me, I need to get my coffee in me today. Um, if I'm choosing to only hire Caucasian or white workers and paying them $10,000 a year more than I would otherwise pay for the quote unquote privilege of hiring those workers, then someone building the same thing as me, my competition, or growing the same thing, or doing whatever action that I'm doing in the market, is going to have a cost advantage. They're able to hire discriminated against workers. They're able to hire people that, you know, non-whites are able to hire women. Or if I'm only hiring white men, for instance, um, you know, then that person that is not discriminating is going to have a cost advantage over me. Eventually, they're going to be able to drive me out of business because my costs are higher. I'm choosing to discriminate and it's raising my costs. So the classical economics argument is that just left alone, discrimination will be eliminated in and of itself because markets will not support it. Now, this is clearly not the case, as discrimination still exists in society and is arguably just as prevalent or maybe not as overtly problematic, but just as prevalent as it ever was in society. So what should be done then? I mean, how do we go about eliminating discrimination? I don't think any of you would try and make the argument that we shouldn't try and eliminate discrimination. Certainly, I could sit here and argue in circles of myself for a while about whether it would ever be possible to totally eliminate discrimination in society. And I tend to think that maybe it wouldn't be, but nonetheless, there is no question that there is a cost to discrimination, that it is detrimental to society, generally speaking, that any time people are treated unfairly because of their membership in a certain group, economic harm is being done, productivity can be, be, be lost. You know, there's many kind of good writings around this kind of work. And again, a lot of economists choose not to engage with it. Those that do, though, I think, generally speaking, do very good work. The, um, you know, cost of discrimination is an interesting topic. That is, ideas around policing and security cameras and private security firms and all these kind of things that how much are these costs raised because of inequality in society because some people are well off and some are not you know the fence is built around stuff both physically and metaphorically so what should be done then what should we do to eliminate discrimination should we use the government uh, certainly it's commonly thought that the government should have, excuse me should have a role in these kind of ideas. Um, however, a national government's not really set up to do so. Perhaps local governments would be better at eliminating discrimination. I mean, if we're going to make that argument, then our local governments would need far more power and funding than they currently have. And do we really want that for our society? Um, there's large historical arguments around this, around local governments becoming too powerful and how that's problematic in a federal state as well. Um, so, certainly yes, the national government, the federal government should have a role in eliminating discrimination. How much of a role they should have, however, really depends on your perspective and what you think the kind of the ultimate goal for society should be around these issues. You realize, uh, those of you that are paying close attention, that I'm asking more questions than I am giving answers for this lecture, as I myself don't have a ton of answers to these points. I certainly have my opinions, which I'm not, uh, you know, they can't help but come through. My bias cannot help but come through in my own lectures here, but I'll leave you to make up your own minds on many of these issues. And this brings us to a really important point here. And that's the uh, difference between active and statistical discrimination. Now, do I want to break this into two lectures is the question here. No, I think we only have about 10 minutes left, so I'm just going to move forward. 
So we have active discrimination is when people go out of their way to discriminate. That is when someone hangs a sign in their shop window that says women not welcome to shop here. I mean, that's a little bit of a ridiculous example in our modern times. Um, but we can all, I think, if you all just sit and think for 30 seconds or not even, you'll come up with uh, many examples of active discrimination in your own lives. Times that you've viewed it, times that you've been on the receiving end of it, perhaps times that you've participated in it as well. Now, in terms of the difference between active and statistical discrimination, simple momentum through time, through society, can really explain much of what we see as statistical discrimination. <clears throat> I'm going to take an example uh, of somewhere that's historically been a white man's working place, uh, the New York Fire Department. Things are changing, but slowly, in terms of the kind of ethnicities and genders of firefighters in New York. And one of the possible reasons that it's taking so long and it's been so slow of a change away from a white man's working place is that, again, just kind of momentum within these, these regions. I mean, certainly one of the big things would be that current firefighters, who tend to be prevalently, prevalently white men, give tips and inside information to their family, their friends, their neighbors for recruiting, for testing, for all these sorts of things. It's not that firefighters are actively racist. I mean, I'm sure some are, but I would hope, and I'm sure not the vast majority. But by doing something that you can't really blame anyone for doing in society, at least I don't think you can, in that they're helping their friends and family, it in a way precludes minorities from fairly competing for these jobs. And this type of networking issue really is hard to observe. How do you observe somebody sitting on their front porch drinking a beer with their, their friend telling them, hey, when you're going to write this test, you know, you need to study for this kind of thing ahead of time and that sort of thing. So, but I mean, just think about how many of op the opportunities in your own life have come from personal contacts, whether they're big opportunities or small and think about people you know, the jobs they have, all these sorts of things, your friends, your relatives, how they got their jobs. Many, many of the opportunities in life do come from personal contacts and then so we end up with kind of a momentum situation where I would hope that the vast majority of firefighters are not actively racist and yet we still have it taking a very, very long time to move away from being a white man's working place. So. The reading, anyway, that I've assigned on discrimination uh, outside of understanding capitalism, the last couple chapters that you'll be reading in that book, um, has some evidence about discrimination in consumer markets. The reading really is the Yinger piece is really a little bit dense in the middle. Um, I really want to make sure that you read the introduction and the conclusion, the most important part, certainly, um, as they discuss some different ways that economists attempt to measure discrimination and things of that nature. And the readings also present an interesting argument that sometimes discrimination occurs to boost profit. The, the classic neoclassical or the click, traditional economist's argument uh, that markets will eliminate discrimination because it eats into profit. If you're paying more to discriminate, you're not selling to certain people or you're paying workers more so you don't have to hire a certain type of worker while you're going to get outcompeted. This paper makes an interesting argument that the complete flip of that could possibly be the case. If you look at a kind of a traditional sense, many economists have argued uh, that inequality, whether, you know, people being unequal in society, whether it stems from discrimination or not, is necessary. Um, in society to have greater efficiency. It's only by having the rich and poor and the segregation between them that we reward those for working hard, who do work hard, and we reward those who contribute a lot to society. And it's only through this kind of relationship that we end up having an efficient and a productive society that we have a great amount of wealth generated and this sort of thing. But um, these are all things that I want you to keep in mind through your reading. 
in terms of the understanding capitalism chapters certainly the um the mosaic of inequality chapter i really want you to uh to make sure you look at that closely i'm not going to sit here in my lecture and go through a bunch of statistics from the book and everything else that are all there uh but the chapter on inequality is very important for the rest of the course there's a little blurb right at the end that i will mention around um the minimum wage and does setting a minimum wage fix inequality and generally speaking, there's a few arguments. I mean, the conservative argument is that a minimum wage does nothing um, for inequality. It just drives up costs for businesses who then raise their prices. It causes inflation, essentially. <laughs> generally speaking, if we have a labor market, we have the price of labor being the wage. We have the hours worked being the quantity of labor. So if you have supply, and this is a very simplistic labor market, supply and demand, you have, you know, how many ever number, Q number of hours worked at an average wage of whatever, $12 an hour for society. By setting a minimum wage, if it's above this level, you're basically saying that, well, the demand for labor is going to be lower. We're not going to want to hire as many, sorry, the demand for labor is going to be lower. Not as many people are going to be hired. The supply for labor at this minimum wage here will be higher. More people will want to work. People will choose to work because the wage is higher instead of choosing to stay home or choosing to have leisure time. In basic kind of intro economics, uh, this has determined your... Uh, the amount that you want to work is based upon a trade-off between labor and leisure. You're either working or having fun. Now, it doesn't leave a lot of room for people like me that enjoy our jobs and for people that, just generally speaking, maybe want to work more and can't find work at any wage or whatever else. But the thought being then that the minimum wage, you're going to have less people working, you're going to have more people wanting to work, you're actually going to have the minimum wage causing more unemployment. Now, I'm not, this is not a labor economics course. I'm not going to go into the great details around this. But it's something that I want you to be aware of at the end, end of the Understanding capitalist cha Capitalism chapter. It does pop up. And then the following chapter is around global development. Again, a little less important to the course, but the real underlying question of are we, as in the United States, people here, are we rich because others are poor? And is this a form of discrimination that we as economists and we as citizens of the world should be concerned about? So those kind of questions I want you to keep in mind moving forward. And thank you all. Your midterm is now posted as well, so or will be soon. No, it is now posted, so please uh, have a look for that. And that's it for today. So... Please uh, have a look. Make sure you do the readings for Section 4. Have a look at the Section 4 quiz, and I'll see you all soon.